I am so excited to introduce you today to Dr. Heffernan. He is a dentist, a prosthodontic specialist working in England. He is from the United Kingdom. And the most exciting thing is that he works in the very town in England, in Eastbourne, Sussex, where in the 1970s, I opened my first dental office, my first preventive dental office. And it's just extraordinary that Dr. Heffernan should be working there today. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Heffernan from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Dr. Heffernan, so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. What happened? Yeah. I mean, you've got a better American accent than I do. <laughs> I've been working on it a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went to, I mean, we were both at um, Guy's Hospital in London. And then, I mean, we've had really similar pathways coming through because I now work on the south coast of the UK in a place called Eastbourne. And you had your I worked own there office. for 10 yeah. years. That was my first dental office, the preventive dental office in England. Nobody had even any idea oh. about it. I was kind of thinking I might get a little picture of your office here. I have you. one. I have one. It was the 70s. I have platform shoes. I have, of course, no gloves, no mask, you know, no nothing. We we didn't even wear gloves. I can't imagine it now, taking out no, 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 I gloves on. But I have a picture, and we will post it uh, with this. Yes, quite interesting. Oh, I used to wear pantsuit which was kind of revolutionary in that time too so uh, yeah so i had a neat little office in eastbourne i will show you where it was but, but then, you were very sophisticated because you went on to switzerland after that i you? well i yes there might have a little interlude in switzerland but i did end up at eastman institute in america and you were you teach now right at the eastman that's right i'm, a, I'm a lecturer because i did my specialist training in america as well so I went over there and I was at the University of Iowa for three years and then the University of Florida for two years and then came back to the UK with an American wife. So it was very, uh, kept it very transatlantic there. That's uh, all in all. Well, that's great. And then the thing that's really, really, really exciting is that you discovered xylitol. And I think yeah. all the people that know me know this has been my passion now for about 25 years years or longer and I was so passionate I made a xylitol product so you also tell us a little bit about that what happened for you that... yeah I mean for me um I mean Eastbourne as you know is a, a kind of retirement town in the UK and as a specialist prosthodontist we would spend an awful lot of time kind of refining and getting people's teeth kind of to a really beautiful healthy state but then something simple could happen, like somebody could change their medication, they could be on some hypertensives or some other types of medications or, or multiple medications. And that very quickly causes people to have dry mouth. And so I was seeing people who were really brilliant at looking after their teeth, um, they'd had their teeth all restored, and then suddenly they would start to get decay on the roots of their teeth. And for us as dentists, that's something that's really difficult to kind of cope with, to deal with. And so I was thinking, well, you know, how is this decay happening? It's happening during the day when people are kind of on their normal uh, kind of business. And then, well, how can we prevent this? Because we brush people, people brush their teeth morning and nighttime. They're very good at that. But how can we actually reverse it during the day? And that was then my pathway down into um, looking into xylitol and then really researching the science and at around that sort of time there were some really good scientific articles coming out of the states actually where they had not just previously where we looked at xylitol very much for younger people this was looking at people in the adult world so it was a really kind of fascinating time to get into xylitol and xylitol made much more sense to me than any of the other kind of alternatives that were coming out at around that sort of time. Yes, so I remember, were there, were you, I remember you well. I was already launched at that point. Uh, I think, you know, I had seen, my, my beginning was with pregnant women. That's where I began teaching, um, actually in Eastbourne. There may be some people in Eastbourne who remember I used to have a slide carousel and a projector screen, and I would go down to uh, a clinic uh, with 
they would be half a dozen or a dozen pregnant women and I would teach them not to put Ribena in the baby bottle and you know how different foods damage teeth and and so forth so that was the beginning and people really I, I couldn't I had the same problem why were these pregnant women suffering so much dental problem I mean they were they were as you say you can be trying so hard following all the things you're told to do in pregnancy your saliva becomes acidic so you're bathing your teeth in acidity all day every day morning noon and night and uh you know th this was this was how i came to it was for children and and uh, mothers and children it was that entire package that uh was so difficult to cope with and uh, yes, I mean, that was all the scandinavian kind of reason why that they have bizarre alcohol in the schools Be and i mean i was just looking at a study there today on the train on the way home and they, they were saying about how if you can stop those kind of harmful bacteria in the mothers then it changes the whole outcome of the child's kind of up to 18 years of age they're still seeing differences in the, the outcomes of of them needing dentistry i mean absolutely it's up to 85 percent they the, the study that they did you know they they took mothers with really bad teeth you know high levels of plaque they were able to measure the plaque the strep mutans levels and they were able to track this progressive reduction over six months. Now, they started the women when they were in their last trimester of pregnancy, which was very clever. And obviously, the, the, this was a Finnish study. They had already, they knew the outcome, I think, before they did it, because it took six months to lower the plaque levels so they would no longer, the mothers would no longer be infecting the children. Yeah. By the time baby teeth erupt, which occurs at around six months for the child, the, the mother had then, because she started in the last trimester of pregnancy, she had been consuming xylitol for nine months. So she had already lowered her plaque levels. Mm. So when she was kissing the baby and interacting with this child, she is transferring healthy bacteria. This is how we see it now. And I hope studies will be done now with, they have better testing to show the development of the oral microbiome. And if you begin, I mean, we always were told in dental school that the mouth health of a four-year-old pretty much determines the long-term oral health of that person yeah. as they progress. Why would that be? Well, the one thing that happens at five years old is the adult molars erupt into the mouth. And basically they're coming into this room full of either harmful bacteria or healthy bacteria. And I believe those studies, if you look at it in that way, all those finished studies adjusted the oral environment, the bacteria in the mouth of that child, usually prior to the eruption of the permanent teeth. So these permanent teeth actually got infected or colonized by healthy bacteria. What a concept. Yeah, I know. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's I know, actually, I mean, there's some more recent studies that are looking at xylitol passing all the way through our gut and it actually acts as a prebiotic in our gut and it can Im improve our gut health as well. So, I mean, it's it's a kind of a win-win-win, really, isn't it? Exactly. And, you know, you talk about the studies from, I remember, absolutely, I was so frustrated because I, I had worked at Eastman trying to teach more about xylitol, trying to do studies actually with the pregnant women and this transfer. I wanted to read, because the study was done out of America and I thought it would be a very powerful study to do at the Eastman Institute there in Rochester, New York. And I applied, I put in for grants each year and was never ever approved and it was frustrating. And I always kept an eye on xylitol studies and you know, I knew it worked. I had my own little community, and we can talk about that in a minute. I had a, a, a restaurant community using xylitol mints. And then it was 2013, and it was January. It was the winter. It was a Christmas vacation. And the Journal of the American Dental Association came out. Which with is a big one there, isn't it? Big xylitol study on adults. And... The conclusions that they published, the printed headlines, showed that xylitol really wasn't that effective. And it was the front page 
of the Journal of the American Dental Association, which in those days was a, not online. It was a hard copy that everybody received in their mail. And it was probably this one journal that every dentist in America would read because they were on vacation after Christmas. They were bored. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they relaxed. So they weren't quite going back to work yet. And this was the headline. And the New York Times picked it up as well. And it was everywhere. Everybody was talking about this. And, you know, I got emails from my friends, Ellie, what's going on? Why is this happening? And I remember, you know, reading the study and being so upset at the way it was done. Now, and maybe I shouldn't have been, but they did it in cl clinics, public clinics. They didn't monitor anything to do with the oral care. That was well. I, I would say, actually, I mean, I come at it. I was looking at it recently, and I come at it slightly differently. I mean, I think I, I look at it as, I mean, it was such a, a brave concept to put forward in the U.S. was to look at this study in adults, and actually, had, I mean, the funding must have been astronomical for it. And in many ways, it's kind of a gold standard in terms of looking at. Uh, a scientific study because it is a randomized controlled trial which means that the actual people who are judging it had no idea whether the people were taking placebo i mean the people didn't know whether they were yeah. taking placebo sure. or xylitol sure. and and actually they that what they had in that study was they had 650 odd people and half of them were taking uh a mint that it was like a lozenge and one of them had no sugar in it but it, it had a, a substance that they knew wasn't going to impact on the bacteria positively or ne negatively. And then the other half had xylitol in it. And so they ran that trial for three years, which is actually a long time to run a trial. Um, and I mean, as you say, the real shame of it is, is that the big headlines that came out, came out to all the dentists in a manner that the dentists will receive and then just three months or four months later, the real critical bit of that study came out <laughs> well, that's right. in a really scientific article that nobody would kind of look well, at. Yes. It's not a whole geek like us. Well, <laughs> that, that and I think people didn't understand that. First of all, I, I mean, I was you were very generous to the study and I, I can see it from that side. But. It's very, nobody's ever claimed that xylitol, and that's how I argued at the time, they were taking five mints a day. It would be a magic bullet if that worked. If you were smoking, drinking, not cleaning your teeth, consuming pounds of sugar, I, when nobody, there was no sort of look at the habits of the people in the study. It was just, do these five minutes a day really work or not? That was kind of the outcome, but you're right. The really amazing thing happened, I think it was April, March or April, about three months later, the statistics were reworked and lo and behold, they found this problem that you were struggling with, the root decay in people with dry mouth I think it was, what was the percentage? Some Well, they were, they were finding 40% difference, which is enormous. And enormous. I mean, as we've talked about before, I mean, in the UK, we don't, we, only about 15% of the population has fluoride in the water. So if you're seeing as big a benefit as that in a population where they are getting all of the benefits of fluoride or toothpaste, and they're seeing the dentist on a regular basis as they were within this study, I mean that's a that's a really big difference to to notice. So and, and the trouble um, was it was published in a in a magazine in America that you had to subscribe to, and yeah. and it was hidden from almost everybody. I think the numbers of people that saw that in comparison that the reworking of this study saying, oh wait a minute, we missed this. It, it's too late. The headlines are out there. It's taken a decade, I'd say, to to almost. Well, I, I mean, yeah. I think it's even in somewhat, I think it's even more of a shame because there is um, a very big uh, scientific body that is very well respected around the world called Cochrane Reviews, yes. where they, they take all of the studies from all parts of the world and they put it together and they kind of look at it and they say, is this real? Does Is there a benefit here? And they did a, a Cochrane Review on xylitol. And... 
again, I mean, they, at the end of it, they came up with, well, there's not an awful lot to be clear about. But actually, in the original Bader article, they found that there was a 10% difference in people that use xylitol. And that's on all of the tooth surface. That's true. And, then when we, and then when we look at root decay, it's 40%. And in fact, I was even so sort of like, when I, <laughs> when I read the Cochrane Review, I wrote to the lead author of the Cochrane Review and I said, hey, hey, hold on a minute. What about this amazing study that was done in America? And he wrote back to me in a lovely email and said, if we were redoing the Cochrane Review now, they would certainly say on the root surfaces of the teeth, there's no, there's no question about it. And, and in fact, even in some of those more recent studies, they're saying that possibly those that original study, they needed to be taking a bit more xylitol than they were taking. So a slightly higher dose of xylitol would probably have made a bigger effect. I just go, why aren't we all recommending this? It's such it's been such an uphill battle between the the timing, the missteps, the 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 lack of funding, the it 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 really has Zalatol has been just a really hard a hard product to gain the endorsement of of peers of mine here in the states. I mean, some I do have some, but it's been hard, and I'm sure it's even been harder in Amer in in England. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, I th I mean, I think within you know i was literally at this weekend um i was at a, a a dental we have hygienists and therapists here and i was at a hygiene and therapist conference and in fact when we first launched we did do a survey through facebook uh within the hygiene community to say how many of you know about xylitol um 100 percent knew about xylitol. everybody knew all of them. everybody knew about it all of them so actually i think within the hygiene therapy community I think that there's a much greater understanding because I think that they look at teeth not just as enamel, root, dentine and fillings or crowns. I think they look at it as the biofilm, the film that is on the outside of all of that. And that, and that obviously lines our tongue, our mucous membranes and everything. And I think the, the, the understanding of the xylitol changing that as a whole is, is actually understood better by hygienists and therapists. So I, I think they are more interested in it, but I also think that the dental community is catching up. I mean, we are now having this conversation about the oral microbiome because we now understand, understand about the gut microbiome. And now we're starting to think about the oral microbiome. And historically, we used to use products that would kill all known germs in our mouths, but now we're realizing that actually we want to keep our good bacteria in our mouths because they protect us. They're our first line of defense. Absolutely. So, so trying to direct that, as, as we now say with our product, Dr. Hefts, we, we say build better biofilm. Cool. Because we're, yes, we're, yes. We're trying to create a, a, a better environment. I hope you're enjoying this interview with Dr. Heffernan from the United Kingdom. And if you would like to order some Zellies, these are my products that were designed specifically for oral health and to taste delicious. Please go to the zellies.com website and enter the code HEFF15, H-E-F-F-1-5 -F for a 15% discount. I think you were way kind of ahead of your time in, in your thinking of it and I know you've had to kind of face you know some probably hard um kind of comments from probably some of your colleagues but you had the last laugh because actually the science <laughs> catching up with you so all, all I'm that's... pleased about is that I haven't I have been able to use this technique for myself and my children my younger children were the beneficiaries of this really i mean they have had no dental work none i mean even wisdom teeth appear to have come through with minimal problem in my now is that coincidence i would love you to do studies on that because <laughs> by by having a healthy microbiome does that enable all these other things to occur in a better way well this is what one of the things that we're looking at at the moment um, at the university here is how can we 
both assess the microbiome and also how can we modify it maybe in a, in a positive way or or is it is it possible because you've got your proteins that are coming through from your saliva which is kind of innate to you so is it possible to modify it that said i've just finished an article on vaping which is going to be published and we're seeing that with vaping that because of the, the variation of those chemicals and the way that they're actually heated up it actually sticks very much to your teeth and your mucous membranes and it is changing the microbiome in a negative way and that's one of the concerns about it okay if you're a smoker vaping is better it's 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 but it needs to be a pathway not to take up vaping but to moving to no smoking but we're seeing a lot of people in the uk a lot of kids who are taking up vaping and they're not smokers and that's going to have a real impact on them um so that was does it doing... damage does it damage or does it just dry does it dry does it do the same thing as dry mouth do you think yeah i mean i i literally kind of took it to pieces in the in the areas of dentistry that we're probably concerned about which is tooth decay um gum disease and and implants does it affect that does it cause dry mouth does it cause bad breath halitosis does it stain your teeth and so i and the big one does it is it as bad as it as carcinogenic as smoking so does it cause cancer um i, I guess we don't the, the outcome of it, of this and this was a lot of research that was carried out in california and then around the world is we really don't know enough because a lot of the oral diseases like gum disease is goes on for such a long period uh it's quite hard to measure and also because a lot of these studies are done in people who have been smokers and now they're moving into vaping it's kind of hard to know, but the general kind of feel of it is that it's affecting our microbiome. Wow. So, wow. And, and that's a lot of that through dry mouth as well. Um, so this is the areas that I think we're going to be looking at more and more is what is a healthy microbiome? What does that mean for exactly. our mouth? Exactly. It's a Which, big question. What is a healthy mouth? Well, I've got to say one of the things that came out of the pandemic over here was we had our chief dental officer here come out with what was called our standard operating procedures going forward. And very much a large part of that was looking at minimal invasive dentistry and prevention. Because if we can reverse or prevent, then that's so much better in a lifetime of us keeping our teeth. And I mean, we know that the biggest risk areas for us really are when we're young kids, through adolescence that's when we get tooth decay and then more so as we get into our older age groups because of changing polypharmacy dry mouth uh, um, inability to be as good at maintaining our oral hygiene that again is when we start to see a lot of problems with maintaining and keeping our teeth plus we've had a lifetime of maybe gum disease kind of catching up with us as well so i mean those kind of two ends of the age spectrum are the critical ones but I mean the good news is that people are keeping their teeth now into old age and and that is I mean in many ways that's a, a kind of a great pat on the back for dentistry in general but probably you know improving our oral hygiene and being more aware of what we're eating and things like that as well. I think people certainly in America you know I do some of these uh, TikToks and 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 interact with you know young people short ones they would never look at the whole interview but but it, it appears they're very aware of having gum disease or having gingivitis which I think most people never knew about and I think today right. I would say most people are aware they have these problems they don't know what to do about them and right. you know that's one of the things I teach a lot how quickly if you can quickly get rid of gingivitis you prevent this downward spiral that's oh massively I mean there was a, a massive um, article in The Economist all about this. I mean, it was literally, you know, you're changing people's outcome, not just in their mouth, but, you know, risk of inflammatory disease like diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's and, and yeah. arthritis and everything. And, and it again, I would like to start with pregnant women and children and do a program that, that helps them start the right way. But the, it, it is important then that 
it's continued. And I, I just, like you, I think that Xylitol is a huge centerpiece for helping average patients deal with the troubles that they have. And tell, tell us a little bit about you, the, the extra ingredients you have in yours. Well, our <laughs> products are not competitive. They are complementary because, I mean, mine were really designed a lot for the average working person uh, who didn't care about their teeth but needed something more to help them. They weren't even going to clean their teeth before they went to sleep at night. Have one of these before you go to sleep and you'll do yourself an enormous favor. That was kind of my approach. You, you were more, you're being in the dental office, I'm sure that you were patients, as you say, we were helping them overcome the hurdles beyond oral care, right? Yeah, I mean, my, well, I was trying to fix it at home, first of all, because my wife was, doing that juicing thing where mixing up a lot right. of fruit um, and she's not a dentist and she said you know my, my teeth just feel hairy from that and, and what it is is she was putting a lot of acids over her teeth and yes. literally eroding her teeth and she said well can't you fix this and and that was kind of my <laughs> pathway into this because and actually for us uh, yeah we've got a slightly different we've gone a slightly different direction we've got um, green tea extract or part of the green tea molecule and calcium and phosphate and so we were very much initially looking at tooth erosion and in fact when I first started on this I was looking at making a shot drink that you would have after a soda or something like that to neutralize the acids and actually remineralize repair your teeth and in that respect the xylitol because it's not we were with erosion you're not looking at the bacteria so in that way the xylitol was not really going to be doing massive amounts but then uh, having tried to kind of fix the home life looking at the dental office and seeing people coming in with root caries and that's where i realized actually if we add xylitol into this mix we can improve the bacterial makeup we've got the ritter study that we were talking about earlier on that proves that we can change root decay and with the green tea and the calcium phosphate, when you've got dry mouth, you have less calcium and phosphate in your saliva. So there's now a reservoir to go back in to remineralize your teeth. And the green tea is our secret ingredient. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing uh, substance, but it protects the collagen of your teeth. And that's how it works. So the combination was why we, we used that. Plus, I mean, we were seeing patients coming in and... They might be a smoker and they'd be eating like an Altoid or a mint that really has a lot of sugar in. And so if we can substitute them away, then so much the better. And actually, I think that and I have this is one of the studies that I want to do this year. I want to look at people who wear partial dentures, removable bridges, because I would suspect that they're probably getting quite a lot of bacteria sitting on that denture that's then sitting up against their teeth. And causing decay so if we could even think that the xylitol uh, plus our other ingredients is affecting that in a positive way then maybe you wouldn't necessarily have as much problems as well but i don't know the answer Absolutely. That's the now green green tea i have a question for you green tea if you just drink it would that have the same benefit or it would it really would and um i mean we we certainly, I mean, when we've gone to speak to people, you know, green tea, I think is absolutely fantastic. I think uh, on the on the flip side, some people don't like the taste of green tea. Um, and also we choose the kind of the very active part of the green tea molecule. Um, the, the most active are the polyphenols to, in, to integrate within our mint. And, and in fact, I mean, part of our studies at the University of Chicago dental school was to see just how that repaired the dentine of of teeth and we we were looking at different levels of that green tea uh molecule to try and find the right level to to get the remineralization effect and that was both for tooth erosion and aimed uh, at uh, root decay as well so we seem to be falling into that that range and and for me the idea is that people have it in their pocket they can go about their business during the day but they sure. can actually be 
repairing their teeth as, as they go about the day. What do you think about cavities? Do you think that it might be more helpful if somebody's got a trying to reverse caries? Yeah, I, mean, I think so, definitely. Are there any studies? Have you done anything with that yet or, or not? Well, I mean, we've one of the uh, bits of research that we did at the University of Zurich was they had people not brush their teeth for three days, so they had really thick plaque. This is hor horrible. It's all right. Horrible. Good. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dental <laughs> thing. <laughs> but they had really thick plaque on their teeth, and then they put a an electrode into that thick plaque, and then they have them drink some sugary liquid. And what we would see is then very quickly the bacteria in that thick plaque starts to metabolize that sugar and form into acid, which is what tooth decay is. And what they then tested is they tested our mints and immediately it reversed, even in thick plaque, that acidic wow. effect. So there's no doubt that you would, if you're reversing that effect on the tooth surface, then you are doing that what we want of remineralization, that minimal invasive dentistry, yeah. we're turning it around there and then, rather than waiting for people to do their toothbrushing morning and night time. That's so cool. Wow, exciting. Yeah. I, wish I, <laughs> I wish I could do research all over the place. I have so many ideas. I know, but, this is it. I mean, you kind of sit there and you think about what you would like to find out. And, and that's where I kind of enjoy dentistry now. It's, it's oh, moving to the next phase. Of I know one thing I have to ask you about, the study you did at home with the straw, because you see, in America, everybody whitens their teeth. You know, I, I, I have a real challenge with the artificial whitening that's going on because so many of these products are incredibly acidic and they are damaging young kids teeth and then their teeth are sensitive and they're furry like your wife said you know they that's what the acidity does to them and uh and then they start to have all sorts of problems but one of the problems they have if they over whiten their teeth over and over again is they stain so much i mean i actually was in uh, the ladies' restroom one day of a dental uh, conference. And obviously this young hygienist had whitened her teeth, brilliant white for the event, had a glass of red wine and her teeth were purple. Oh. I mean, they had, it had literally, I don't know what the combination of the whole thing was, but she was in the, in the ladies' room sobbing her heart out because she had purple teeth. Oh my gosh. And um, one of the things I guess they tell you, I, I have never whitened my teeth. I, I, I'm old school. I, I, I don't. And, and one of the things I know that you're told is not to drink col colored liquids for a few days afterwards. And sometimes some people extend that by trying to drink through a straw so that the liquid will not touch their newly whitened teeth and I always that's now being translated for acidic drinks people who are I can't worry about the people with their whitening I mean I, I I can't help them but but the people who are trying to drink drinks through a straw to stop their teeth being in contact with acidity I tell them I've told them for years you'll simply erode your back teeth and I was talking with yeah. you and and tell your story you you were trying to prove this to your daughter well, is it? No. yeah well i i've always been i mean we we base on dent in medicine dentistry we always kind of look for scientific evidence to base how we do our, our our kind of job or whatever but you also have to kind of mix with that a little bit of not skepticism but is the evidence really what you're reading about does it does it add up and to me whenever i would use a straw to me it feels like the fluid goes everywhere and then I, I started to look back at the original studies that everybody keeps on repeating. And when I look back at the original studies, they really didn't add up. They were, they were doing this, actually it was at Guy's where we trained. Oh, they, gosh. <laughs> they did this video uh, fluoroscopy, which is uh, a x-rays, x-ray videos, which you wouldn't be allowed to do now. And they had people drinking barium. And this was actually quite recent, as far as I'm concerned. It was 1990s. Wow. And what they found is that they were looking at these uh, a video from the front, a video from the side, and they were trying to translate where the liquid was going from these videos. But there really wasn't a great deal of detail as to where it was going over the teeth. And this was the, the study that everybody's quoting. 
So I decided, uh, much to the horror of my kids, that I would do a, a study at home and I got some pl plaque disclosing liquid and we we actually, I think the video might even be on YouTube somewhere, <laughs> but we did this video of us um, trying to drink, first of all, with the straw kind of where I normally have it just between my front teeth. And then my daughter tried drinking with a straw further back towards the back of her mouth. And the, the plaque disclosing liquid goes everywhere. And that, and it just goes to show that no matter how you drink with a straw, it's not going to go straight down your throat. There's no way. It's go around it. And so, actually, I mean, the truth of this is, is that really you're better off with a drink, just drinking it and not having a big, you know, loads of sodas and just sipping, sipping, sipping throughout the day, because otherwise your mouth is never able to neutralize those acids. So you need to drink it and be done with it or find an alternative uh, that's not kind of erosive to you. Well, I, I think that that's harder and harder. So my, I agree with you. Drink it, be done with it, have a Dr. Hef or a Zellian, yes. and you're all set. <laughs>My patients are really good at brushing their teeth morning and night time, but throughout the day, that's when tooth decay and tooth erosion happens. And that's why we created Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints, because they actually neutralize the acids within 30 seconds of taking them. That way you're repairing your teeth on the go during the day. Very simple, tastes great. So Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints are available online or else you can buy them from your dentist as well. How do we get to minimally invasive dentistry in the future? How, how can you persuade dentists that it's in their best interest? Not I, think it's really, I think it's really difficult because in the UK, we've tried a number of different schemes, both uh, paid, what they say, pay, paid by per item of service. So if you, if you put a filling in, you get paid for the filling, but then that would potentially mean that you're going to, have some people who may over treat. So on the flip side, uh, we've tried in the UK having a capitation scheme whereby you get paid for looking after your patients. But on the flip side, you can get some dentists who then do nothing and they under treat. I think it's a really difficult, difficult area. And even with there's some schemes where you have health insurance or med dental insurance here, where the dentist gets paid the same amount every single month to basically look after you. And I've seen some dentists uh, who are absolutely fantastic. I mean, they're really motivated and others just sit back and, and just kind of take the money. And, and it, it, it's, it's really sad. I, I can't quite fathom that. But to me, that's probably the best of all models that you, that the dentist is there for you, is getting paid, a nominal fee per month. With that, I think, to me, you would need to balance in, actually more importantly, appointments with the hygienist. Because I always say to my patients, actually, do you know what? I think the hygienists are much more key to the treatment because they motivate you to keep on top of your oral hygiene. Because we're not there when you're in your bathroom at night brushing your teeth. We're not there when you're in the pantry choosing what you eat. But hygienists are much better at communicating the importance of the daily home care than I think dentists are. That's, I mean, that's just my my. Yes, view. I mean, I I feel that this this we totally connect on the reason for pristine teeth it is really your health at the end of your life is going to be better okay. if you have maintained pristine teeth or they damage your teeth has been properly restored in the way a prosthodontist like yourself would restore so everything is beautiful everything is is in under control but how you get that to occur i think there's an educational component which is what i try to take on to, to mm. teach people the value of a pristine tooth, the value of not filling a tooth. And that's yeah. the difficulty when a dentist is being paid to fill one. I, I would expect that your maintenance fee model, the dentist would be more um, patient with a patient, you know, from this yeah. point of view. 
why don't we try this for three months or come back in a month or two? It, let's see if we can reverse this cavity. Mm -hmm. I believe most patients think that cavities are like forest fires. And I believe that most cavities are really quite slow moving. Yes. And as long as you adjust the biofilm and modulate that and then put in some other adjuncts, you know, a fluoride rinse or, or whatever somebody will do to try to wind that cavity back. Oh, it would be so nice if that was what dentistry was more about. Yeah, and There's I think that, better equipment I think that, for that I, I, I think that is the way it's going. I mean, I do. I, I do kind of work with young dentists and, and they are much more aware of this opportunity for minimal invasive dentistry and actually taking steps to move that forward. We're now looking at radiographs and if we are seeing that the caries is still within the enamel, we will not touch that. And, and that's certainly a change within my career. Um, is, and, and especially now with the improvements in taking radiographs, the detail that we're getting, um, I think that that is that is hammered into dental students now. That, that there's no need to pick up your handpiece to to damage that tooth because there's nothing we have that is as good as the original tooth. There's no. Say that again. That. Say it again because this is music, music, music to my ears. Well, there, there really isn't. There's nothing that we've got in our armamentarium that's as good as the original tooth. And I and particularly if you're starting to go into that borderland between the tooth and the gum because if you're going into that zone that you've got all types of issues with kind of the 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 fibers from the gum that insert into the root and suddenly you're damaging all of that so you're losing both the barrier of the tooth and the gum and also you're actually making a a zone that's going to be colonized most likely by bacteria that that's more difficult to keep clean um so yeah, maintaining teeth at all costs um, should be the, the level of the day. And, and we see that now. There's a really big move towards, towards how to modify that tooth surface to make it better without us filling it. Wonderful. Well, I'm really excited. And, and you said all the things that I... <laughs> oh, yes, I felt very alone for a lot of years, um, particularly because I have never been an advocate for flossing. And, and I'm, I, I did actually debate with some British dentists, um, ooh, quite, I think it was 2012, there was an article written about floss in the London Times by Helen Rumbelow. And yep. she, she had used my techniques that I recommend people use instead of flossing. Yep. She'd gone for dental evaluation, then she went away, tried xylitol and, and, and the rinses and things that I recommend and then gone back for a dental evaluation and found that her oral health had drastically improved. Yeah. And when she told them that she hadn't been flossing, of course, they couldn't stand it and neither could anyone reading her article in the newspaper. And I forget, uh, there were a couple of British dentists who are on the BBC World Service talking to me about this. And <laughs> I'm explaining that if you don't have plaque in your mouth, you probably don't have these deposits that we would know as plaque. I mean, yeah. it's not, there aren't those white fluffy things growing on the surface of your teeth. If you, Sorry. I mean, I've been eating xylitol now for probably close to 20 years in a enough, uh, you know, frequency and amount every day to diminish any plaque I might possibly have. So, well, that is recognized over in within the EU. We have the Food Standard Authority, which allows you to make certain claims based on the science that's out there. And for xylitol, one of the claims you can make is reduce plaque and remineralize teeth because it has been shown to reduce plaque. So it, it is, you, you're right there, Ellie, you're right there. So you're, you're a spot on. Wow. Um, I think the interesting thing is, Around implants is where I'm kind of wondering now, what what are we going to find? Can we, because it's a completely different surface. Sure, sure. Um, and actually, we don't really have very good technology that's predictable about how do we turn around a failing, ailing implant. So how can we change that?
Interesting. And that is where I think, again, that there is a potential with microbiome to try and influence that in a positive way. Interesting. So yes, I, I mean, we were, we were talking about it today that often, I, I'm sure, often implants are put in for people who've had periodontal disease, right? They've lost their teeth because of periodontal disease. Yeah. So the fact that they then get the same disease around the implant, it's now called implantitis, but it's really the same bacteria in the mouth, right? I mean, it's... Exactly, yeah. It's it is. Just... And, and, I mean, we warn our patients now that if you have had per periodontal disease, gum, gum disease on your teeth, there's a really strong likelihood that you're going to get gum disease on the implants as well. And, and I mean, when I finished my training in the US, 20 odd years ago, I was much more gung ho about implants. But over 20 years, we've now realized that actually implants have issues too. They're a great solution for people uh, if they're missing teeth or their natural teeth are untouched and you don't want to kind of damage them by putting in a bridge or something like that. Mm -hmm. Implants are the best thing. Sure, sure. So they're not without problems in their own right as well. And, and that's kind of important for people to know. More things I, I'm so happy to hear you say because because <laughs> so many people think, oh, I'll just have it out and have an implant and they don't yes. realize it's going to have the same issues unless I, I do have to talk to you at some point about the rest of my complete mouth care system because we, we've talked so little. We've really talked about xylitol and I see listening or I hear listening to you. I think it may be a very good moment for us to talk more about the rest of the program that I recommend and the results, amazing results that I can achieve for people. Um, well, well, I think it all comes back down to what you were saying there earlier on. It's, it's one, it's motivating patients to look after themselves. And I mm -hmm. think that that is the key message. I mean, if people are looking at their mouth and not just doing what my son does when he brushes his teeth, which is putting <laughs> his in and then looks at his phone for two minutes, yeah. and the toothbrush is just yeah. in the same place. <laughs> As my uh, business partner, Toby, who's part of Dr. Hefts, says, he's got a thing about mindful brushing, mindful toothbrushing. Absolutely. Brushing. Conscious and, brushing. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you're making your whole mouth care system based around people being mindful and, and being aware of what they're doing, I think that is is great. And they do. They think. They tell me they think of me every time they brush their teeth. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's good or bad. <laughs> Do you make them put a picture of you in them? In the I know, I, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so, so that's great. Well, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful. And uh, I hope we can, you know, I can come to England and we can do one side by side and that you'll that have 